Jen and Cam are two funny ladies who like to talk about murder, mass murder, murder suicide, serial killers, spree killers, thrill killers, contract killings, honor killings, and a whole lot of other shit. Too heinous for me to list here. If you're disturbed by this sort of content, you may want to listen to something else. And if you're a child trying to listen to our true crime podcast, well, you better ask your mama. <laughs> Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm good. Guess what this is? Our very last episode. Real, real, full episode of 2022. Or, as you you like to call it, 2022nd. 2022nd. Yep. Hey, it's all the same. It's all the same. It is. A little way it is. Yes, it is. Well, you ready to go? Yes, let's get to it. If you remember back to, and this is why I kind of saw this and I was like, huh, okay. So a long time ago, back in January 22nd of 2020, before COVID hit us all and demolished us for a while, I did an episode called, well, Hello, Dolly. And it was number 70. And the story was about a gentleman that lived in the attic of this family's home. Well, this one piqued my interest because it's very similar, but also different. So right. you ready? Now, the Hello Dolly, that was the man that lived in the house, was the woman's or the wife of the lover. home. Yep. Was her lover, right? And she yep. kept him up there. She was a kept on purpose. Man. Yes. This one was on, a, on secret, yep. which I know is one of your biggest fears ever because we've talked about this. Yes. Having somebody move into your house and you don't know it. And you and don't know it. And nobody else in the house stay knows it either. There for yes. a long I don't time. like that. That is a no-go. No, thank you. That is a no-go. Move along. (laughs) And see you bye-bye. Yes. See you bye-bye. All right, you ready? No, thank you. Yes, let's go. Here we go. Today we are going way back in time to 1899. This was when Philip Peters and Helen, who had just become his wife, were married and purchased a cute little house on West Moncrief Place on the north side of Denver. Phil had just begun his new job at the railroad office. Now, if you imagine, this is like, you know, they're starting their life. This is good. They're young. It's Newlyweds, they're happy. Yeah, it's it's good stuff. Mm -hmm. New job, new wife. Everything's going well. New life. There you go. I just added that. In an effort to make friends and get to know the neighbors, the couple joined the Mandolin Club. Now, this is a group of adults that took lessons from a young man named Theodore Edward Conies. The 17-year-old was an amazing musician, but he was not well. Doctors would say that the young man would never live to be 18 years old. Phil Peters took this young man under his wing, welcoming him in for not only lessons, but for, you know, a hearty hot dinner, little chat all that stuff. They ended up, you know, he... They became friends. Yeah, they became friends. The two shared stories about growing up. The young man had not yet finished high school, nor did he have a job, since he figured he would be dead soon, so why bother? Oh. Honestly. Young Theodore was used to people staring at him and making fun of him for his sickly appearance, but it still got to him. Theodore just wanted to be like the others, a normal young man approaching adulthood. But it was not to be. Phil and Theodore stopped the mandolin lessons and drifted apart. Years passed as everyone is busy in their lives. You know how that is. Mm -hmm. Late one evening, Phil Peters ran into a thin man he did not recognize. The man knew Phil, and Phil knew he should know him, but he couldn't place him. As the man spoke, Phil realized that this was Theodore, and he was very much still alive. Now, this is years later. That's got to be a shock. I don't think so. you don't he think it's a shock? He was no. I said I meant. would. I oh, would okay. think so. Okay. I, I was going to say so. would not think so. He wasn't no, supposed I would to live past so. eighteen, and here yes. he is. I would think so. As the two chatted for a little bit, Theodore told Phil that he was not doing too well. His mother had taken all the money that they had made and given it to a man to invest. Uh, you've heard the story, right? Mm-hmm. But it was a scam. The man or the money would never be seen again. Theodore told Phil he was staying in downtown Denver 
where he was caring for his sick mother. Phil explained to Theodore he just couldn't afford to give him any money. You know, Theodore has was kind of hinting around about needing a little bit of money and can you help me out. And Phil was like, listen, I just I just can't give you any right. money right now. Due to I'm my in wife. Bed spot yeah. Myself, right. Yeah, due to my wife. And we're gonna and here's where we hear about that. It's October 17th, 1941, and Helen is in the hospital recuperating from surgery to repair a broken hip. Neighbors knew that 73-year-old Philip had been home by himself, so they all took turns having him over for dinner so that he would not be alone. You know, he spent in the entire day in the house by himself. He's retired, all that good stuff. I think he worked for the railroad, I want to say 45 years, 40 years, something like that. It was a long He's time. been working on the railroad all the live long day. That he is. has been working yeah. on the Yes, he has. Uh-huh. Every day, the neighbors would invite him over. You know, they'd leave him alone throughout the day, but they at least wanted to get a little meal into him at night and a little company, all of that stuff, so he wouldn't have to be by himself. So here comes an evening, and Phil was expected to come over to a particular neighbor's house for food, but he didn't show up. Not sure why, the neighbor went to Philip's house and knocked on the door, but no one answered. Worried something was wrong, she gathered a few more neighbors and went back to the house. After checking all the doors and windows, they finally located a window that was unlocked, and a neighbor crawled into the window. The worst fears became a reality when the young woman started screaming about what she had discovered inside. Philip Peters was savagely murdered in his own home. When police arrived to the scene, they discovered Philip in the bedroom, bloody and severely beaten with several blows to the head. Next to his body was a pistol. The killer had used the butt of the pistol to beat him about Mm -hmm. the head and face. Pistol whipped him? Yes. A broken walking stick, which was his that he used to carry around, and a stove shaker. You know what that is? I had to Google it. Stove shaker is the little uh, tool that would the old fashioned wood stoves and all that. And you'd get in there and like shake to heat up, heat it up a little bit. There you go. And would it be you more know? like a poking stick for like fireplace place type stuff? Or? Kind of, but it was yeah. more like a, um, not even a poking stick. It was more like a handle, almost like a handle kind of. Gotcha. So Philip's watch and money were on the dresser, meaning that it was not likely a robbery. The front door was locked, but here you go, Jen. The front Mm -hmm. door was locked from the inside, and it had a chain on it, which means, you know, somebody, they're not going to break through that door to do that. Right. uh, Kind of indicating that the murderer had either been let into the house and then escaped some weird way, or maybe were in the house waiting and then escaped. In the kitchen, they note two skillets present, one with dust, indicating that it had not been used lately, because you got to remember Helen was, had been in the hospital for a while, and one that was shiny clean next to a kitchen towel that had blood on it. Whoever killed Philip left no clues and seemed to have just disappeared. Disappeared. Huh. Just disappeared. For now, the leads went cold. The house would remain empty until Helen was well enough to come home from the hospital. She'd come back to the home that she had lived in all her life. Even though her husband had been brutally murdered in the house, this was all she knew, you know, so she wanted to go back to this house. So she went back to the house and um, she had a nurse that had come and stayed with her. So one night back at home, and this was right when she got home, something scared her and she fell yet again and injured her hip again. This time, however, she did not want to go back to the hospital. She was done staying in the hospital, and she wanted to stay at home. So a nurse was hired to stay there full time with her. This nurse would be there to tend to all her needs, take care of her, all that good stuff. Well, one night, the nurse, and this is kind of scary, one night, the nurse was up and heard some strange noises in the house. She got up to look around and couldn't find anything, so she phoned phoned police. Mm -hmm. Exactly. She phoned Mm -hmm. police to come and investigate. The police came, and they, too, were unable to find anything. A few nights later, she would report a figure on the back stairs that was, it was big, it was dark, she couldn't tell, but it, it looked like a full-grown, I guess, man. Her out, her out, she put a for sale sign in the yard, <laughs> Pretty and much. she left. She, the, the nurse was like, yeah, I'm done, here's my resignation, and yep. I am <laughs> See out. ya. See you, bye-bye. See ya. I'm gonna join a monastery, and, uh, yeah. This nurse? Don't yeah, call. she was... Yeah, the nurse was positive the house was haunted, and she Mm -hmm. was like, see ya, bye-bye. Now, Helen still needed care, right? So a friend of theirs agreed to stay with her and care for her until she was well. 
Well, all was fine. It always is at first until it happened again. A strange noise woke her up and without turning on the light, she had decided to... F- now, this is brave because I'm a chicken, as you know. Um, I do. <laughs> and if I hear a noise, you better believe I'm turning every light on the house. Yep, spotlights, I'm, I'm turning it. I, I want everybody to know the house is lit up. But anyway, so the, the, this little lady, God love her, said that she heard the strange noise. And so she was like, I'm going to catch this. I, I'm going to figure this out. So she went through the house without turning on the light. Nope, I don't think so. Mm-mm. Quietly, she made her way to the kitchen to see if she could catch the ghost, in parentheses, in action. And there <laughs> it was at the bottom of the stairs. Okay, mm-hmm. whoop, there it was, that, that ghostly figure, mm-hmm. if you will. So she called police who came to investigate yet again. The neighbor described the ghost as dirty and stick thin. When she screamed, she said, it ran and disappeared. Well, that was all it took. Helen Peters would leave Denver to stay with her son on the other side of the state. So now the house is empty again. And at this point, you know, they're thinking the house is haunted. They're not. Right. They're not, they're not really thinking what's going on. So, they're, yeah. yeah, there's no way that they'd think. That's mm-hmm. the, I think the last thing that you would think is somebody's living in your home. Mm-hmm. So as time went on, you know, the house is empty, furniture's covered, all that good stuff. Police uh, are starting to talk around to the neighbors who would report seeing some odd things at the home when no one was supposed to be there. There was a light that would appear in the home and then go out. There was a woman who claimed she saw a face looking out the window through the curtains at her one night. And of course, you know, the whole neighborhood is talking about how the Peters home is haunted. Could you imagine? This would be like us as little kids running around trying to go see this house. Uh Of course we would. Little kids? What do you mean? Or now. Do that now. Whatever. In July 1942, sick of the gossip and the phone calls to the police station, two Denver policemen were like, yeah, we're done with this. We're going to go put an end to this. So they were sent to keep an eye on the house. So the idea was they were supposed to stake out the house out on the street and just watch. Well, days went by and the men noted nothing out of the ordinary. But then one day, as they're watching... The mailman was making his way through the neighborhood, dropping off mail as he traveled along. The officers are watching him. And then just by happenstance, I guess, one of them glanced at the house and saw it. It was quick, but he caught a glimpse. The curtains in the home separated and a face appeared between them. The ghost was watching the mailman as well. Hmm. Dun, dun, dun. The policeman jumped out of the car, and one of them started to blow his whistle, trying to get the figure's attention, and the ghost shut the curtain. Ghost no. shut the curtain. Yeah. With, the men, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The men rush to the house, and they make their way into the home. The house, which had been shut up for months by this time, smelled stale and dirty, because, you know, Helen left, and Phil's gone, of course, because he has passed on. The furniture was covered in sheets, and dust was about a half an inch thick on all the tables. As the officers make their way up the stairs, they see a closet door swing shut. That would scare the bejesus out of me, I tell you. Oh, yes. Same. Running to the closet, ripping it open, they see two legs with bare feet hanging from the ceiling. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. they open the closet, and there's these little dangly feet. Officer takes a swipe at the pants to try to grab them and pull them down. But the old material was so, I guess, old and just not in good shape. Worn. Yes, tore the material, it shredded, it just came right out in his hand. He jumped up again as the ghost, if you will, was making Uh his way through the hole, and this time he grabbed an ankle, and he was not letting go. A yelp echoed from above as a leg and a body came tumbling down to the ground. The officer pulled the figure outside the closet and put him on the ground. The man was unconscious, apparently he had fainted from the ordeal, the man that was calling through the thing, the the attic. Yep, yeah, that's right. The man not the was ghost. Not, no. No, the, it was a real man. Yeah, it was a real man. The man was not in good shape, extremely frail. So an ambulance was called to the scene. They thought he was close to death, and he really was. He looked starved. He was super tall, super skinny, just in really, really bad shape. As officers waited for help to arrive, one of the other officers attempted to climb up through the hole into the attic, but the hole was so tiny All he could do was stick his head in and look around. 
The space was so small that it could barely hold a person up there with little to no headroom. There was a bed in the attic made out of crumpled paper and an old ironing board. So the ironing board was kind of broken and paper on top of it. Talk about uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Apparently, someone had been living in the small space for quite a long time. Once the man was alert, they brought him back to, gave him a little food, all that good stuff. They took him to the police station. And they wanted to hear the stranger's story. And woo-wee, what a story it was. Theodore Conies was born on November 10th, 1882 in Petersburg, Illinois, to a hardware store owner and his wife. When the father passed away, the mother took her son and they made their way to Denver, Colorado. Theodore was not a healthy baby and he suffered from the start. Theodore's lungs were weak and his body fought one illness after another. Doctors would tell his mother he would not make it to adulthood. Theodore was also an angry kid because he was treated so poorly by his peers. Thinking he would never live past 18, his mother yanked him out of school, and this left him rather uneducated and obviously not much of a working path. I'm guessing as a mom thinking her son's going to die, probably, I don't know, she, you know, she waited on him, all that stuff, and thinking... You know, you don't need much of an education or a path in life because you're not going to last long. Right. So it was at this point that he began his life as a recluse, relying only on himself. Theodore became a drifter at the age of 18, working odd jobs and just frankly trying to get by. In the spring of 1912, Phil Peters ran into Theodore once again. Theodore told Phil that his mother had passed away and that he was struggling to survive. Theodore was going to join the military, but he was not allowed in. He was denied. Right, because he was so ill and thin, right? Yes. Theodore started staying in any place that would have him and places no one would want to stay, as in under a bridge, on the side of the road. He's homeless. You know, he was pretty homeless, yes. Pretty. You either are or you aren't, right? That's true. It's like <laughs> pregnant. You yeah. either are or you're not. 1941, after a stint in New York City, Theodore had come back to Denver, but time had marched on and Phil and Theodore had lost touch long ago. During the years, Philip and his beautiful wife grew older and they would welcome three children to their happy marriage. They would all grow up and move out. And once again, Philip and his wife were back where they started out, alone in that cute bungalow house in North Denver. Theodore waited in the police station to tell officers what had happened that evening. Theodore said that he was starving and he came up to his old friend's house after looking around for a bit. Thought the house was empty, so he broke in to steal some food. What Theodore didn't know was that Phil was home. He was just sleeping in the bedroom. Theodore tells officers that he went to the home to sneak some food and didn't think Phil would remember him since it had been years since they had seen each other. Pretty much like he's just going to, he was watching him outside. He's going to sneak in there, just grab a little food make his way but you mm -hmm. know how that goes right mm -hmm. so when theodore was in there and phil woke up yeah that did not go over so good theodore would say that he knew that either he or phil would have to die and it was not going to be him hmm. so theodore took the stove shaker which like i said is a big like handle metal handle kind of like i guess you know like a i don't even know what you want like a crank kind of and attacked phil with it as phil tried to escape after he killed <laughs> phil Theodore washed the stove shaker and then went up to the attic to hide. Now, his initial plan, of course, was just to steal food and maybe some other things and move along. But once Theodore was inside the home, he really liked the warmth and he was dry. So he decided, you know what, I'm just going to stay for a while. Now, at first, Theodore was really careful not to make noises or move around too much. But as time passed, Theodore became bolder. Now, he, he had snuck in there before he had murdered Phil, of course. Right. So he'd lived there for a little while. Um, and then that one day when he got caught trying to steal the food, that's when he had to kill Phil. But he had moved in there. Um, he went in there to just get a little warm, all that stuff. Helen was in the hospital recovering from her hip surgery. And Theodore was really careful not to make any noises, move around too much. But, of course, as time passed, he became a little bolder. He would say it was kind of a game to him. He would... He liked to stay hidden in the house, and then um, when, no was, when no one was home, he would come down from the attic, stare out the windows, hence why the man saw him, 
looking at the world around him. This is the only way he could kind of get an idea of what was going on in the world and also be a little bit jealous of it, I think, because he was always, you know, kind of an outlier, if you will. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Theodore had lived long past his 18th birthday, but still looked really sickly, almost deathly at age 59. So he lived a lot longer than he was supposed to. Yeah, I wonder what really, what he had. He had some sort of respiratory lung infections and things. I'm sure like today you would get antibiotics or something like that, you know? Right. Yeah. Huh. Theodore was taken into custody and would find his forever home that he had so desperately wanted on November 18th, 1942 at the Cannon City Prison. He was sentenced to life. In prison, he would finally build a life. He put on weight and started working at the prison library as a librarian. And he loved, he loved it. He loved his them. work. And that, that all of this made me think too, like if he had a decent, because he lived quite a bit longer too. If he had a decent, you know, diet and things like that. But anyway, he loved his life as a librarian, doling out the books. He kind of liked that power and being, you know, recommending books and being Mm -hmm. able to say who got books and who did not. When Theodore's story got out in the media, because of course it did, he was nicknamed the Spider-Man due Mm -hmm. to how small the hole was that was used to get in the attic. Because police would say that someone would have to have spider legs to get through it. Now, um, from what I saw, it was somewhere between 18 inches and two feet. And that, that's pretty tiny for an adult man. It really is to, oh, to get yeah. up there and stuff. Back then, too, unlike attics today, which are almost the entire, for the most part, almost the entire um, length of the house, this was just a tiny, teeny tiny room. Um, It was described as being slightly larger than a coffin, so tiny. And the little tiny hole to get up there, it had a, um, you know, a light bulb on a chain, I guess. Um, And then, of course, it had the ironing board bed. It, It was tiny. I mean, it was basically just a bed. Theodore would remain in the prison until his death on May 16th, 1967. See, he lived a lot oh, longer than he... Th- See, that's what <laughs> I'm saying. Just a little bit longer. A little bit Holy longer. Care. If I could math, I'd figure that out, but... So that is the work. story, and it, and he's been known as the Spider-Man or the Spider-Man of Denver. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got a couple different names, but... And it, it's a terrible story, but the fact that I just don't like having somebody live in your house and you don't know it, that mm-hmm. is creepy. No, I can't. I can't deal with that. And just so he, the thought he, of it. He broke There's in a there. Daniel LaPlante, that oh, one yeah, too. Yeah, yep, and yep, no. Yep, yep. No, it's my worst nightmare. Well, and like he, he said too, it was um, at first he was like super quiet until he knew that Philip was gone. Then he would come downstairs and eat food and peek out the window. And that's how the neighbors saw him. And they thought it was a ghost. And the mailman would see him. But And he had said that he liked looking out there because he would look at all the people on the street knowing that I think he had a little, dare I say, low self-esteem or I don't even know what, you know what I mean? Like he'd been heckled and bullied all his life and made fun of because he was sickly looking, super skinny. I think he weighed like 130. And for a guy, an adult male, that's pretty... Mm -hmm. And then. he wasn't he wasn't that short. He was a taller guy, lean guy. And so I think, uh, you know, at first he, he thought that was, you know, fun. And what happened was he was in there and he was going to steal stuff, just some money or whatever. And then he was like, you know, this house is pretty cozy. And so he, he thought, found a closet and he kind of fell asleep in the closet. And he was like, I kind of like this. Well, mm-hmm. then as he dug around, he found an entryway into the attic. And he was like, wait a minute, I can stay here. And he he had said that the attic was freezing in the winter and hot in the summer, but it was oh, still I can better. Only imagine, yeah, still better than being on the street. Like at Under least you're bridge. a little safe. Yeah. Wow. So that is the story of the Spider Man of Denver. I just found that interesting since I did the Batman story. 
from mm-hmm. long ago as well about people like just living in a house and nobody knows. You yeah. think that sometimes you should, but I don't know, maybe you hear how, I don't know, ask the fine people out there. You hear house creaks and house, I don't know, you know, stuff. You hear Making things. noise. I don't know. Yeah. You see some of those videos too where the people, um, weird things, and I'm sure they can be faked, faked too, but they still creep mm-hmm. me out. How yeah. things have gone missing or whatever, and then they place a camera in their house, and then they see somebody crawling, crawling out of, like, out of the, the cabinet. Closet. Yeah, yes, God, no. that'd be terrible. No, that freaks me out. Like, just well, the, um, horrible. The, the it's like criminal... the movie, the, even oh, yeah. the movie The Strangers, where they come in oh, with yeah. masks and yeah. you don't know that they're in the house. Well, the uh, it's uh, criminal, my worst nightmare. Criminal podcast, which I really love with um, Phoebe, mm-hmm. Phoebe Judge. If you don't, it's short, best sweet, voice and yeah, yeah, best it's voice really in podcasting. Good. But um, she did a whole episode about something similar to this, and there was a girl. Check it out if you can. It's one of my favorites. Um, there was a girl that uh, I think she was in college, mm-hmm. and so she had a car, and it was like a little junker car. I might have said this on the podcast, and if I did, I'm sorry, but maybe not. She had a junker car, and she like one day she got in it, and she noticed things were like moved around, and she's like, "Well, that's weird." But then there was like some change on the like the dash and she was like huh so then she came uh, again came in and the car like the sweater that was up in the front seat was in the back almost like a blanket like and then there was like a little flower and so basically there was a homeless guy that would come and get in her car at night for warmth and shelter and she was okay with it and she was like he left me little presents they never saw each other and it went on for like nine months they never saw each other um, and it was just kind of, she was like, I left my car unlocked for him. It was just kind of a little understanding. He never did me any harm. And then he left me little presents. And I kind of felt like I was doing him a favor. So like I left a blanket in the car and he, you know, climb in the mm-hmm. backseat and use the blanket. And I was like, wow, that's weird. But in the same episode, it was somebody that was living in, in the, uh, the, like above in the, the, I guess, is it the attic or the above? I guess it would be the attic, right? And this girl was like, she... <laughs> I mean, I cannot imagine. She's mm, like in no. her bedroom and she sees like the tile, the ceiling tile, you know, move. like the drops move. Yep. Yep. I was like, I would have a freaking heart attack. So anyway, criminal. Check yeah. it out. Well, uh, I just looked this up because I remembered not too long ago in an uh, article, February 5th, 2019, a woman, she was a junior at the University of North Carolina at Green- Greensboro had been noticing things going missing in her house, like or like misplaced or missing. Mm-hmm. And then one day, and here she thought she had a ghost. She always locked her door, and there was never a sign of that anybody had broken mm-hmm. in, but things would go missing. Mm-hmm. And then one day she heard a noise coming out of her closet, and she opened it to find a 30-year-old by the name of Andrew Clyde Swafford, <sighs> S-W-O-F-F-O-R-D, standing there in her clothes. What would you do? And she, I don't yeah. even know what you do. Uh, and this is from an article for, is it BuzzFeed? Yeah, yeah BuzzFeed Buzz News. Yeah. She said, quote, I just hear rattling in my closet. It sounded like a raccoon in my closet. The student identified as Maddie oh told Fox God. 8. Quote, I'm like, who's there? And somebody answers, me. He's like, <gasps> oh, my name's Drew. <laughs> I opened up the door and he's in there wearing all of my clothes. Was he mentally ill or was uh, he like... It doesn't say. Officers arrived and um, at 3.30 took him into custody. He wasn't violent or threatening. And uh, he was booked in jail it Had a in lieu of a $26,600 bond, suspected of breaking entering as well as identity theft, larceny, possessing sp- stolen, go- stolen goods, and failing to appear in court in connection wow. with previous cases. Which is... Well, yeah. think about it, and this is the girl in me. Think about showering. Think about going to the bathroom, and like there's somebody in your house. I, I don't know. That's terrible. But oh. then also about like sneaking and getting food, and like they would just take a little food. I'm like, yeah. have you met me? I'm gonna go down there and make a stew with roast beef. Like oh. I, I couldn't live on a couple crackers and a slice of pizza every once in a while. Oh wait, That's here's more work. from the here's more from the article. Hold on, <laughs> according. Listen to this. According to Fox 8, building management changed the apartment's locks in December after a previous unexplained break-in. The student and her roommate found two men inside their apartment who they didn't know and notified property uh, managers. 
And then the last sentence is, the women are now planning to move out. <laughs> you think? Really? Oh, yeah. my God. Uh-huh. Well. Yeah. I hope they're moving out or they cut some sort of rent <laughs> deal with the new renters, the yeah. new leases. Yeah. No. Uh-uh. I'd be gone. Yeah. I'd just say, well, you would, in your head, you'd play that back, too. Like, Oh, yeah. How long was this person in here? Remember when I was <laughs> dancing naked to, like, you mm-hmm. know, uh, moves like Jagger with yeah. Maroon oh, 5? No. You, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, no. oh, boy. Uh-uh. No. But, yeah. <laughs> Who's there? Oh, it's me. <laughs> I can't believe they answered. <laughs> oh, my name's Drew. Yeah, it's me. Just Drew. You don't know me, but oh, here I am God, wearing Drew. all of your clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Not creepy at all. No, no, no. Hmm. Well, see, so I guess it's a... Uh, More normal than we think, I guess. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. No, People that's are why. a little yeah. crazy. A little yeah. crazy. In a good we, way. Um, you know, I've been yelling ever since we covered the... Anthony Lorette story about the mm-hmm. guy just coming into the house. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been yelling at everybody to really make lock sure that they lock the door behind you. That so, has been echoing in my head every yep. day. Mm-hmm. So um, over Thanksgiving weekend, my husband bought one of the door locks that automatically lock and you have to use a keypad. To every, we each have our own individual pin oh. numbers to get in. Uh-huh. So that's How's what we've it been going? doing now. It's great. Nobody's forgotten their pin. Um, the that door was locks. my next question because Every, my kids yeah. would be like, I don't remember. And they're screaming. Okay. Well, chances are their pin number is the same number that they use to unlock their phone. So they're not going to read. They're not going to they forget yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So but that's no, five, nice. two, five, four. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just kidding. So no, it's really nice um, that it locks automatically and you can hear I do it lock. Play. I can't and, not. Okay. So. I, this is probably TMI, but like in the mornings, you get the dog out, the cat, feeding the kids, blah, blah, blah. So usually like, you know, with the cat, the cat and the dog the, going outside, not the cat, mm-hmm. the dog. Every time I don't lock that door, I think Jennifer's in my head. Lock that door. Good. Lock the, so then Good. I'm like, oh, God, lock the door. <laughs> Good. Yeah. You, it's you don't want anybody coming in. It's not uh, a good. No, thing. I do not. I, and I sure don't want an extra roommate. I don't know about name Andrew in my closet or in my clothes. Just, well, when he's Woo. wearing your clothes, it's Drew. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Drew. It's Drew. Drew. Yeah. It's me, Drew. <laughs> it's God, me, Drew. It's awful. <laughs> it is terrible. Oh, uh, yeah, not funny. No way. All right. No, well, I you just... know, this is the very last episode until I know. twelve nightmares. Before Christmas, and then also until January, what? When's our first day back? The 11th, I believe. I will be mm. back with our very first 2000. Oh, good. It's you. Thank goodness. Yep. I get a break. 2023. Cannot believe that. It's entering our fifth year, Jen. This summer, it'll be five years. I know. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? Oh, boy. Thank you, long everybody. Five years. Long, long five years but of it's been learning. Very enjoyable. Mistakes. Bad audio, crying, <laughs> tears. Lots of tears. There's no tears in podcasting, but yeah, there there's really lots is. of tears in podcasting, yeah. but you can't hear it because you don't record that part. Or when you do, then you, you know, mm-hmm. we can't use that audio. Take it off. It's so awful. there you go. Oh, Zero. well, but now we have our lovely Nico, and he we do. Thank is good. Uh, the savior goodness. of. Well, uh, let's be honest. We would have been done. of our true crime podcast. We would have been done. What four and a half years ago? <laughs> exactly, we would have been made dead. It. Two months it's, in, we would have been dead. Thank the good Lord for Nico. So but anyway, yes, I we just will say, be back uh, January eleventh. Yep, and a giant shout out to all of you. We love you. We adore you. Wouldn't be here without you. This mm-hmm. is me getting a little sentimental. It's not me to do that. It's usually Jen, but uh, yeah, it's a uh, amazing. Cold hearted. I am cold hearted. That's mm-hmm. right. Um, <laughs> Thank you from the bottom of my cold, dead heart. Um, so, yeah, thank you. It's yeah. a, been an amazing ride. We've met lots and lots of people, lots and lots of listeners. Yeah, I don't know. It's amazing. Like, you can't, I guess you can't really explain this to people that you, no. you know, that you've talked to people from Australia, Ireland, England, South Finland, Africa, South Canada, Africa. Uh, people that reach out to you. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. So. We've learned different cu- where different culture countries are um, on the map. Sort of, they'll come up and they'll say, "You've, you know, your number 
14 at this country and we're like where the hell's that because we've never excelled in look geography. at us we're number two in malta oh my god where's malta <laughs> is that we're, in south america <laughs> no it's yeah. not south america yeah yeah, yeah so anyway, anyway we appreciate do you have you. any other words you want to leave? i, I feel do like- have on closing out um mm-hmm. you know in a couple days we are starting our 12 nightmares before christmas um that starts on the 13th of december and um, some of them are pretty, um, you know, they're murdery. And uh, we have a promo in case you need a nice palate cleanse. Our friend Jason does a nice little, it's fun, a parody called Santa Maybe a Criminal. It's a lot of fun. I started binging it a while back. They're just starting their second season, I guess. And it's all about a character by the name of Richie Buck. And he is a pest control technician, carpenter, and sometimes a wise man at his church's Christmas pageant. <laughs> but he is <laughs> he is uh, trying to save Christmas. It's really cute. And if you Aren't listen, and if you listen, you might hear the voices of some of your uh, podcaster, true crime podcasters. Aww, Not us. Maybe. Maybe someday we'll be on there. But um, there are some big names in there. I believe Bob Ruff is on some. Um, oh. And I believe Nick from True Crime Garage is on there. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Tim and Lance from Crawl Space. Mm-hmm. So um, some big name podcasters are on there. Maybe Any one day we can join them. podcasters you know about? Or? Uh, I believe Shiloh from LA Confidential. Okay. And cool. Rebecca from, or I'm sorry, LA Not So Confidential, and Rebecca from Dialogue. Oh, cool. Are the two that are like just off the top of my head. Those are the ones that I recognize off the top of okay. my head. Cool. I like so, it. So, yeah, it's it's really cute. It's really funny. They do, he does little ads and little elf voices. It's really well produced. I think Jason works in TV. Uh, you guys will enjoy it. I've been enjoying it. There and will be the a trailer. What's the name of it again? It Santa. Again. Maybe a criminal. And the trailer will be right after we leave, I guess. Yeah, right after we wrap this up. So, yeah. Uh, And so, um, I guess until we see you in January 2023, which seems so weird. That seems so weird. Remember, for real, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Bye bye. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at ourtruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by hosts Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Vertese and Dick Vane. Make sure to like and subscribe to Our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production. We're here in the matter of the United States of America versus... Is a collect call from a person presumed nice until proven naughty. Santa Claus. Y'all, Santa Claus is locked up and I'm going to get him out. My name's Richie Buck. I'm an amateur podcaster and investigator. I'm an investipodster. I came up with that. If you like true crime, feelings of the holidays, and I ain't just talking about Christmas, and satire, well, Santa may be a criminal, just might be for you. Some of your favorite true crime podcasters have joined in to spin this yarn. I'm Chet. If the mitten ain't a fitting. Can you tell who's who? Stop acting like And is Santa a criminal? Let's find out together. Could be some kind of elf in Tourette. Santa may be a criminal. Listen and subscribe now, wherever you get your podcasts. Got run over by a reindeer. Ho, ho, ho.